We continue our study of Hebrews. Uh, today uh, we're into verse 2. Uh, so verse 1 into the beginning of verse 2 uh, reads, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Uh, so last week, uh, we considered that God has spoken. Uh, but remember, the theme of the epistle to the Hebrews is that Jesus is better. Uh, this letter was written to Jews uh, who had come to faith in Christ, uh, but due to pressures, uh, they were considering ditching Christ. But the writer of Hebrews urges them, hold on to Christ. Christ is better. Uh, and here, uh, right at the beginning of the epistle, he is making the point that Christ is superior to the prophets. He is superior to any revelation of God that came before him. Now, we're not to misunderstand this. Uh, the prophets, um, all that we find in the Old Testament, it is God's word. Uh, and all of scripture, we said uh, last week, all of scripture is one united message. But God's revelation of himself in Christ is superior in three ways. Uh, and so notice that the beginning of verse 2 here, um, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, that statement contrasts with verse 1 in three ways. And uh, the contrasts concern the when, the who, and the how. Uh, so firstly, the when. Uh, what came before Christ came long ago. Um, that contrasts with how God has spoken to us by his Son, uh, as verse 2 begins, in these last days. So long ago contrasts with in these last days. As verse 2 begins with but in these last days, I think what the writer is getting at is this. Uh, all that came before Christ was incomplete. Uh, all that came before Christ was unfinished. But now, in these last days, Christ has come. Uh, so that now, what came before is completed in him. Uh, now, I haven't got the, uh, the seven-volume commentary on Hebrews by John Owen, but I do have a condensed version of it. Uh, so bear with me now. Uh, but John Owen writes of how, at many times, denotes the whole progress of divine revelation from the beginning of the world and consists of four principal parts. The first was the promise given to Adam of a descendant. The second was to Noah after the flood. The third part is the revelations made to Abraham. The fourth is the revelation to Moses in the giving of the law. Uh, this had three subsidiary revelations that were given to David, to the prophets after the division of the kingdom, and to Ezra. And then he writes this, In contrast to this general revelation of the mind of God under the Old Testament, the apostle intimates that now, through Jesus the Messiah, the Lord has at once begun and finished the whole revelation of his will according to their own hopes and expectation. Um, in the Garden of Eden, a seed was promised. Uh, a seed was promised then to Abraham. Uh, the throne of David would be established forever. Uh, all of that, all of those things, they were all the word of the Lord. But it was an unfulfilled word of the Lord. Now, that's what's going on here in that phrase, in these last days. Now, the word before, uh, all that came before, now, in these last days, finds its completion in Christ. I don't know about you, uh, but I, uh, I don't enjoy those films or television dramas that end in an obscure kind of way, uh, where the author or the scriptwriter uh, kind of leaves it up to you to decide what happened next. Uh, well, I don't like that. Don't uh, tell me uh, what happened. Uh, don't let me speculate, uh, especially in a drama where things might have gone either way. The Bible 
is not like that. Uh, the anticipation, or perhaps we might say the tension of the Old Testament, it is fulfilled, it is completed in Jesus Christ. Uh, so we could say, uh, who is the seed of the woman? Uh, how will all the nations of the earth be blessed through the seed of Abraham? How will the throne of David be established forever? Here is the answer, Jesus Christ in these last days. Uh, God has spoken, one commentator puts it like this, God has spoken fully, decisively, finally and perfectly in him. Uh, you see the point uh, the writer is making to these Christians. Uh, if you ditch Christ, your Hebrew scriptures are unfulfilled. Uh, they will be unfinished books to you. Uh, the coming of Christ means that we now have a complete book. So that is the when. Uh, the second way in which verse 2 contrasts with verse 1 is the how. Uh, so what is the how of verse 1? Uh, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Uh, what is the how of verse 2? Uh, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Last week, uh, I gave you a quote of how uh, the authors of scripture were all very different people. Uh, some were kings, others were statesmen, priests, prophets, a tax collector, a physician, a tent maker, fishermen. But none of these people were God himself. Uh, they were prophets revealing God and his purposes but the revelation and the prophet is Jesus Christ. Uh, there were many prophets, but there is only one Son of God. Uh, listen to these words of John the Baptist from John chapter 3. Uh, John the Baptist explains to us why Christ is a superior prophet. Uh, so John 3 uh, verses 31 to 34. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Now, the prophets who came before were at an altogether different vantage point. Now, when I was a student in Aberystwyth uh, for two years I lived in the town and uh, the streets of Aberystwyth are small and narrow and uh, lots of the buildings in the town are tall, uh, three or four stories. Uh, so for that reason uh, at street level there's only so much you can see. Uh, but if you climb Constitution Hill or Pendinas or go through uh, Pengleis Woods to the viewpoint, in one glance you have a view of the whole town. The prophets, if you like, were at street level. They could only see so much from their limited vantage point. But Christ, John the Baptist tells us, Christ is from above and being from above because of his intimacy uh, because of his communion with the father he speaks in a way that no prophet ever could uh, Howell Jones writes this uh, there is a fullness and a finality about God's self-revelation in a son which cannot characterize the ministry of any prophet not one of them nor all of them together could match a son as a messenger for truth known and declared. Now, the third way in which verse 2 contrasts with verse 1 is the who. Now, the who of verse 1 is God spoke to our fathers. Now, that contrasts with verse 2, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son. Think again then of the situation here. Here are people considering ditching Christ. 
the writer is saying to them, but Christ is the key. He is the key to the scriptures. You can read the prophets, but the prophets make sense because Christ has come. It's in that sense that as Christians today, we read our Bibles backwards. In him, all the types and figures are fulfilled. And so there's something personal here, isn't there? God has spoken to us by his son, to these Jews. He has spoken to you because here in Christ, here is your Messiah. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is God's final and decisive word. A couple of years ago, as a church, uh, we bought lots of copies of an evangelistic book by Rico Tice. Uh, the title of the book was Capturing God. And uh, if you read it, you might remember how he, um, right at the beginning of the book, he describes a particular photo that he has of his family. And he describes how for him, uh, that is the photo that best captures his family, what they're like. Uh, a photo that he describes um, for various reasons for him. It brought out uh, the characters of, of the different family members and somehow that photo summed them up. But then in the introduction to the little book, he writes this. Imagine being offered one photograph that captured the essence of God. Imagine that God offered to hang in a frame an image that revealed everything he wants to reveal about himself. Now, what has God given us? Well, our verse today. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. If the character of God could be captured in a single scene, what would that scene be? Uh, well, that little book of Rico Tice's is about the cross of Christ. Uh, there we see uh, the heart of God, his giving of his son for his people, uh, his love for the unlovely, uh, as Christ takes the wrath they deserve upon himself. Uh, what is God like? We see what he is like at the cross of Christ, all the judgment, for all the sins, for all of his people, there at the cross was poured out on Christ. Uh, think of the anger you might feel towards a criminal uh, found guilty of the most awful crime. We're not righteous people ourselves, and so our anger is not like God's anger. And so when you consider God's righteous anger, consider the love of God seen in Christ to take such wrath upon himself. Uh, all of the wrath for all of the sins, for all of his people. Uh, the title of that book is perhaps a little futile. Uh, surely we can never capture all that God is. But here we see, here in Hebrews, uh, we are to give our special attention to Christ. We are, as sinful people, prone to think wrongly about God. Our tendency as Christians is so often to question his love and his care for us. And perhaps that was the problem of the Hebrews. Uh, they were not confident that he would keep them through trouble and through persecution. Well, the writer here, right at the beginning of this epistle, says, look to Christ. We have the assurance that God is with us. We have the assurance of his love for his people as we behold God in Christ.